Welcome to The Woman's Connection. I'm Barry Louise Switzen, your moderator. The Woman's Connection is a program about events shaping women's lives and helping one gain authentic power on a personal or a professional level. So won't you stay tuned? Welcome. Our guest followed her passion and turned a hobby into a job. And with me is Elizabeth Chubuck. And I would like to welcome Elizabeth. Elizabeth, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me tonight, Barry. My pleasure. Now, you're a cheesemonger. How did this all evolve? Well, let's see. About three years ago, I was working in a job selling advertising for a big magazine, feeling pretty bored and unsatisfied with it, and had an expense account with which I was expected to entertain my clients. I wasn't a big fan of going to the nail salon to get my nails painted and thought, why not find a way to explore something that I was interested in while entertaining them? I've always been a huge fan of cheese, so I signed up for classes at Murray's Cheese Shop in the West Village. And within, I started going the first couple of classes. We had a great time. Uh, everyone enjoyed themselves. The cheeses were amazing, but I was on the edge of my seat, thrilled, covered in goosebumps, so excited about everything that I was learning. Cheese has this history behind it. It comes from farms and animals and it ties into the culture and the place that it comes from and it's been such a staple in my own diet as well as the diet of humankind for thousands of years that I just was, I felt alive for the first time in a while. Uh, how, how long did it take you before you transitioned from your advertising job to becoming a cheesemonger. I spent about two years volunteering in the classroom at Murray's and learning about cheeses. They had offered me a couple of jobs, but I was in a position in my other job that was really hard to let go of. I was making really good money, and I wasn't be having to work that hard. I had a lot of vacation and time off. That's not bad. Not bad at all. <laughs> but when you're not doing something that you love and every day is spent with this, this tedium of a job that doesn't mean anything to you, that starts to take its toll. And so I had reached a point after about two years where I had been learning so much about food that my own beliefs and philosophies started to get in the way ethically with the work that I was doing, selling advertising for really large industrial food companies. And at that point, the job opened up at Murray's, and they offered it to me, and I couldn't say no. Now, you go around and you teach classes, mm -hmm. all right? And you teach the chefs what cheeses are coming in, how to taste them, how to sell them, and et cetera. What would you say was the biggest challenge to you once you made the transition? I think the biggest challenge for me was understanding the culture of the kitchen in New York City. Because my first, first and foremost, my job there is a wholesale manager, and it's really more of a menu consultant. We carry about maybe 200 cheeses at any given time, and for chefs to sort of navigate that collection can be a little daunting. So I talk to them, talk them through the options, understanding the concept of their menus, help them choose the cheeses that are going to best suit their needs, and then I go in and train their staff to sell them. I oftentimes sometimes sit down and get to taste through the cheeses with the chefs, and it's amazing, but the culture of restaurant kitchens in New York City is very specific and incredibly fast-paced and sort of cutthroat in a way. It's exciting, but it was a big transition for me. You've been so kind and you brought up some lovely cheeses here. I did. They look scrumptious. Thank you. Do you want to describe each one and then we can do like a mini tasting? Certainly. Okay. That sounds like a great idea. So when you're thinking about composing a cheese plate, you want to get as many different milk types and cheese styles, as well as cheeses from different countries represented as you possibly can. Okay. So the first cheese that we have is a cheese from the Loire Valley in France. It's called Chevreau or Chevreau uh, without the French accent. And it's what we call a bloomy rinded goat cheese. So Bloomy rinded cheeses are things like Brie's and Camembert. They have this sort of white downy rind on the outside of them. If you look at this cheese as well, you'll also see that bloomy white rind on the outside. The rinds are formed by the addition of mold spores to the milk. Two classic mold spores that they add are Penicillium candidum or Penicillium Camemberti. Camemberti, like Camembert. 
There's one other kind, which is called Geotrichum candidum. And Geotrichum candidum is what they use on the rind of the chevreau, and it forms this sort of wrinkly, brainy-like texture on the outside of it. And basically, the way these cheeses age is that they add the mold spores to the milk when the cheese is being made, and they, once the cheese is made, they set the, the wheels on straw mats in hot caves or aging facilities that have high levels of humidity and uh, and low excuse me high levels of humidity and also relatively warm temperatures not hot but warmer than a refrigerator can you eat the rind rinds are always edible with the exception of cloth or wax or plastic rinds but it's really a personal preference that comes down to texture the rind on the chevreau and let's just taste it here the rind on the chevreau is uh, very soft and skin-like, and therefore have a bite. And therefore, it's going to be edible. The, the flavor on the rind is definitely going to be stronger than it will be in the paste. So the paste is this part of the cheese here. Okay, that's the. And the rind is what's on the outside. So anything that's surrounded by the rind is called the paste. Exactly. All right. Now this tastes like it's a goat cheese. Ding! Spot on. <laughs> It is a goat cheese. The Loire Valley is typical. Goat cheeses are typical of the Loire Valley, particularly the small format ones. It's a climate that is fairly moderate, and so farmers lived relatively independently of each other, which meant that a farmer and his wife and their family had a few goats that they milked mostly for personal consumption. The farmer's wife, before breakfast, would go out and milk the goats, bring the milk back, serve some of it at breakfast. What wasn't used on oatmeal or porridge, whatever they were eating, was set on the counter while she went off to finish morning chores. When she returned from chores, the milk had started to acidify. And in order to prevent the milk from spoiling completely, she would control the spoilage. She would convert it into cheese. Cheese is simply the controlled spoilage of milk. And what, what okay. happens when you have a small amount of milk left over is that you make small format cheeses. And that's where we get the Loire Valley goats. It's really good. Now, you smelled it. Mm -hmm. What do you smell when you trying to find a... I don't know what the right words are that you use. What do you smell when you smell the cheese? You're smelling for different things. First and foremost, you're smelling to find out if it's gone bad. None of these cheeses have gone bad, but essentially when animals or humans smell their food, it is to determine whether or not it's safe to be eaten. Humans are actually the only animals that don't intentionally smell their food before eating it every time, which is an interesting fact. But when I smell the cheese, I'm, what I'm smelling for are, I'm looking for an essence of the place that it's come from. I want to smell the milking parlor. I want to smell the cheese house where the cheese is being made. I want to smell the farm. I want to smell the grass and maybe the flowers and perhaps maybe even the baby goats that are going to be around if you have lactating uh, female goats in the farm. So when I smell this one, I get a little bit of what... <laughs> and that's what you just have to put it self-consciously up to your nose and smell it. But what I get when I smell this one is uh, just a little bit of, of goatiness. So if you've ever been on a farm where they have goats, goats have a very particular smell to them. All animals sort of have their own characteristic smell. And goats can be very stinky, particularly the billy goats. You and brought several cheeses. I brought several cheeses. Uh, the next cheese up is a cheese from Galax, Virginia. So this is a domestic cheese, and it's called Meadow Creek. Um, Meadow Creek is the name of the dairy, and Grayson is the name of this particular cheese. Um, you'll notice this one, in this one that the appearance of it is totally different. The first cheese was very, very white and almost chalky in appearance, and this one has a much sort of smoother, bright yellow uh, paste with this orange rind on the outside of it. This is what we call a washed rind cheese. Washed rind cheeses are the stinky cheeses. Oh, great. They are things like Epoise and Telegio, and they actually come originally from monastic traditions. So monks traditionally... And have Thank a, you. And this one, don't forget to smell it before you eat it. That's not too smug, stinky. It's not too stinky. No. It's young right now. Oh, is that what it is? Mm-hmm. I get some buttery notes to it. Well, I got mostly rind this time. Wait a minute. Mm. It's almost like a butter. With like, but yeah. no, with a nice sort of tangy quality to it as well. Oh, it's a nice one. It's like if I think if it's set out, 
And what was the word that you used mm -hmm. if it sits out for a while? It tempers. The cheeses tempers. are tempered, meaning brought up to room temperature. Okay, well, I think if it sits out for quite a while, it'll be really more like butter. Mm-hmm because it's got the color of butter. Exactly. The color of the cheese actually comes from the fact that the cows are fed on grass. The cows are only being milked and, well, they're being milked all year round, but they're only making cheese when the cows are out to pasture and eating mostly grass. And that's where you get this bright yellow color in the paste. Cows do not process beta carotene, which is vitamin A, the same thing that makes carrots bright orange. And therefore, when you have very healthy cows eating a very good, healthy diet, you get cheeses and milks that have almost a straw yellow hue to them. And this one in particular, I get almost like smoky notes on the rind, like maybe some cured meats, but it's fairly mild. What's interesting about this one is that the bright orange rind, they don't add any mold to the milk in order to produce this rind. What happens is they, they make the cheese, they form it into a big square block, and then they wash it on the outside with salt brine solution and then a, a solution that's infused with different types of mold spores. And what that does is it actually prevents the growth of that white mold and causes the growth of brevibacteria linens or bee linens. Bee linens are what are responsible for the bright orange color and also for the smell that is characteristic of this style of cheese. The third one is actually a buffalo milk cheese. It comes to us from Lombardy, Italy and it's called Cassatica di Bufala. And Casatica, I've heard different translations. It means old house, little house. Um, it also just means um, maybe buffalo milk cheese of the house. And you don't have to eat the whole thing. Ah, oh, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, in Italy, buffalo milk is traditionally used to make mozzarella di bufala. First of all, what do you notice about the smell in this one? None. Very, very mild smell. So it's not a sneaky cheese. No. It's another bloomy rinded cheese like the Chevro, but larger format. Completely different type of texture. Mm -hmm. Almost like, I say, if, if pudding and jello fell in love and had a child, <laughs> that's the texture of this cheese. <laughs> the next cheese up is uh, one called Garrocha, and the particular producer of this Garrocha is uh, called La Bauma. Tony and Rosa. Shweka are the people who make it. How many cheesemongers would you say there are worldwide? Oh, that's, I couldn't even begin to imagine. <laughs> because we get such a small selection here in the country because you have to be pasteurized, and which is another question I want to ask you is what's the difference between pasteurized and unpasteurized, and why does our government want the cheese to be pasteurized, I think, what, 60 days? What's the... So, What's the rule behind that? Yeah, laws about pasteurization. In this country, the FDA has decided that any cheese that is made with raw milk has to be aged a minimum of 60 days. So anything younger than 60 days has to be made with pasteurized milk. Now, pasteurization is simply a process of heating the milk to a specific temperature in order to kill off any potentially harmful bacteria. Louis Pasteur was a Frenchman who invented pasteurization, which sort of aided in the development of the industrial dairy system. In the United States, uh, pasteurization came about, well, became common practice sort of in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Basically, as population densities in cities increased, the milk or the dairies, urban dairies, were overcrowded and the cows were living in very horrible conditions with no exposure to the outside. They were being fed oftentimes a toxic byproduct of whiskey distilleries. The cows were sick. The milk was being collected in open vats that, was being, that were being handled by many different people, oftentimes men who had tuberculosis, and they were coughing and spreading, you know, contaminating the milk, and then it was going out through the city, and babies and elderly people were getting sick and dying because of it. So pasteurization came about really as a means to save the country. I don't think that the United States would be where we are today if pasteurization hadn't happened when it did, because it really stopped the spread of a lot of diseases and, and made, the, made it feasible for people to survive in the cities. But most of the cheeses that we sell are most of the small-scale farmstead or artisanal cheeses um, at Murray's or other shops in the city are if they're made with raw milk, they're being made on such a small scale that the risk of contamination is very low. If you only have 
a hundred cows, yeah. and your main, your only source of income is by milking them to produce cheese and sell that cheese, you're not going to let those cows get sick. Or if they do get sick, you're not going to let that milk get into the batch of milk you're using to make cheese with. How do you look for a cheese? Okay, let's say you go into Murray's Cheese Shop and you've got 200 cheeses in front of you. How do you know which one to pick? I mean, where do you start? Where do you start? That's a good question. And it's one that everyone asks. I say start with something you're familiar with. Don't buy that one, but approach the cheesemonger or somebody at Murray's, they wear red jackets. We refer to them as a, as a red jacket. So you approach a red jacket and you say to them, hey, I've had camembert before and I really liked it, but I want to try something that's a little bit different within the same vein, something that's familiar, but going to be different than that. And they're going to offer you tastes of different cheeses and offer you different descriptions of cheeses that are stylistically the same, but perhaps made with a different milk type or perhaps from coming from a different country. How do you store all these cheeses once you get them home? Is it hard cheese you store one way and how do you so store soft cheeses another way? It's a question a lot of people come to us for. And Ideally, you can come back to the. You, ideally, when you come to the cheese shop, you buy a small enough portion that you don't have to store it. Cheese in the cheese shop is being stored in as close to ideal conditions as as exist outside of the caves uh, that, where the cheeses are being aged. So, in the in the perfect world, you would stop by twice a week and pick up your piece of of cheddar and your piece of uh, pecorino and maybe a form d'ambert, your, your blue, and take them home for dinner and come back again when you needed more. But if you have to store them, a good rule to go by is that hard cheeses have a low amount of moisture in them and therefore are not in much risk of spoiling. The best way to store a hard cheese is with a bit of parchment paper wrapped securely around the outside and then plastic saran wrap on the outside of that. Basically, when you're storing hard air aged cheeses, the worst thing that can happen to them is that they lose their moisture and then the texture is, is not good or they pick up off flavors from other things in your refrigerator. A bit of paper on the outside of the cheese provides sort of a barrier for them to sweat a little bit. The paper absorbs the moisture that the cheese puts off and then, but also contains it so that it, the cheese doesn't dry out completely. And if the cheese wants a little bit of that moisture back, if it's starting to feel a little dried out, the paper's right there with the moisture, like stored in it, ready to give it back. The plastic on the outside prevents the moisture from evaporating completely and also prevents the cheese from picking up flavors of leftovers that are stored in the same shelf or vegetables in the crisper drawer. Garocha, if you notice, has white mold and sort of this mauve colored mold and this beautiful gray it's like on the outside, like marbly, or like a river stone. Um, Garocha is an Alpine style um, or a Pyrenees style cheese that's made with goat's milk. Whoop. I'm just going to use my hand here. And so the Pyrenees Mountains uh, cut between, they border northern Spain um, and southern France. And they produce cheeses that have this very, very smooth, almost creamy paste. It's a, it's a semi-firm, it's a, a relatively firm cheese, but there's a creaminess to it that comes from this style of, of cheeses. They are cheeses that are made in styles that can be aged for a long period of time, ideally through the winter. Now, smelling this, I didn't smell too much. However, when I tasted it, Full it, of it. it was kind of like a goat cheese. It is a goat cheese. Oh. The Garocha doesn't have a lot of smell, but what I smell when I smell it are very slightly fungal notes and sort of like a minerality. <laughs> get it? Just get it right in there. I'm not sure which is the right. Maybe if you if you break it in half a little bit and expose some fresh cheese. Okay, I smell something, but not a lot. It's not really. It's a not lot. a particularly pungent cheese. But it's a very creamy mm. cheese. Very creamy, smooth pasted cheese. Almost soft. The Alpine styles. I gotta have a grape to go with it. <laughs> to cut through the salt and the fat. Alpine style cheeses are things that are coming from Swiss cheese and Gruyere and Comte originally. They're cheeses that have a very sort of smooth, relatively firm paste, and they're also the good melters for the most part. 
Wow. The next cheese up is a sheep's milk cheese from Lazio in Italy, or Lazio. Uh, pecorino is an Italian word that is generic for little sheep's milk cheese. This one is one of my favorites because it's a very good, clean expression of sheep's milk, and it has a cool rind on the outside of it. It's called pecorino ginepro. Ginepro means juniper in Italian, and the rind is um, cured in a, it's, it's bathed in a bath of balsamic vinegar and juniper berries. So the flavor doesn't really, it doesn't really impart that much flavor into the cheese, but it creates a very dramatic, beautiful cheese that has really clean, lovely, sheepy notes to it. Do you eat that rind? You can. Thank you. Um, it's, it's, the rind on this one is going to be a little firmer, a little, a little tougher. What, what do you notice about the smell in this one? There isn't any. Oh, it's there. It's just subtle. I'll tell you, it's really subtle. Yeah, I smell something, but not. There's like almost a slight, like a, a slight tanginess to it in the smell. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> what do you it's, notice about the texture? It's hard. Hard. Um, almost crumbly. Crumbly, and as it sits in your <clears throat> mouth, it kind of becomes creamier. Becomes creamier. And then it has a long, sort of delicate finish to it as well. Once you've swallowed the cheese and there's nothing left in your mouth, if you exhale through your nose, you're not getting it. I'm <laughs> not getting it. <laughs> well, there's this thing, it's called the retronasal effect. And wine people talk about it all the time. That when you taste the wine or when you taste the cheese and then you, when you've swallowed all of it, you've sort of cleaned it off your palate and you exhale, it pulls the aromatics back through and creates this kind of long finish to the cheese. Lanolin is vitamin E and it's an oil that is produced by the skin of sheep and basically it keeps their wool from becoming brittle and dry. But it has a very specific odor and flavor to it that you sometimes pick up on in sheep's milk cheeses. What is this? This one, this is a blue. Mm -hmm. uh, from Jasper Hill Farm, or the cellars at Jasper Hill, which is up in Greensboro, Vermont. I'm glad we've got a few American cheeses oh, here. Oh, I would not have done a cheese plate without doing a few Americans. I thought about doing all American cheeses, but then there were too many others I just couldn't bear to, to leave behind. So, blue cheese is formed by the addition of mold spores to the milk before the cheese is made. Mm -hmm. Penicillium roccoforti or Penicillium glaucum, two different types of mold spores, are added to the milk, but they need oxygen before they can become active. So once the wheel of cheese has been made, they let it sit for a couple of days to age, and then they pierce the wheel from the outside inwards with sterilized needles, and what that does is it creates little tunnels and passageways for oxygen to enter into the center of the cheese and start the blue veining from the inside moving outwards. But if you notice sometimes on this one in particular, the blue is in almost like a stripes, like veins of it. Can you see? Yes. Uh, that's because those are where the needles have gone through. Well, that's simple. They ca okay. talk about blues having a striated appearance to them, and that's from the oxygen traveling through the tunnels opened up by the sterilized needles. So this is a raw cow's milk cheese. Thank you. It's modeled up, and don't feel free not to eat the whole thing. It's modeled after mm. a traditional Stilton or form d'Ambert. Oh my God, this is incredible. Mm -hmm. Oh, I forgot to smell it. <laughs> I can tell you one thing, my fingers stink. <laughs> it has almost a fudgy texture to it. And can you add chocolate to this? <laughs> That's the classic pairing. Everyone loves this cheese with chocolate. Oh, really? Ah, okay. And you can and eat the rind? The rind on this one you can eat, but it's not going to add a lot to the cheese. No, it doesn't. This is a very special uh, and sort of esoteric cheese. It's a cheese that they say has been in production for over 2,000 years. It's made sort of in the mid-Pyrenees region, southern France, southern central France. And it's made in the mountains. Only when the Salaire's cow, the Salaire's is a breed of cow, only when they're out to pasture eating only grass. And the interesting thing about the Salaire's cow is that they're very big, bulky, sort of beastly cows, beastly animals, and they can only, they will only give milk when their baby calf is nearby them. And so in order for them to give milk, they tie the baby calf to the mama cow, to the mama, the, the sow cow, and then have to be milked in the field 
where oh they're out goodness. to pasture. Which means that the Solaire's cheesemakers or the Solaire's farmers are sort of like hiking through the mountains every morning to go milk these cows, carrying wooden buckets to collect this milk. And I've heard, I haven't seen it yet, but I've heard that they actually wear a funny belt that has sort of a, a rod coming out of the back of it so that when they get to the cows in the pasture, they can just sit back onto the rod and they have a stool right there, throw the bucket underneath and immediately start milking. <laughs> I love it. So it's another raw cow's milk cheese. Um, and it's, it's one that has a, a flavor profile that's difficult for some people. Difficult, it's, cha it's a more challenging flavor. Go ahead and grab a bite. And definitely take a smell. No, I smell this. Yeah, but I don't know what I'm smelling. I get sort of a lactic quality to it, like a like a, a like a slightly soured milk quality, mm -hmm. and maybe some fruity notes to it, like a slight sweetness within that sour. I lactic got the sweet. Quality. I got the sweetness. The sweetness. Now that sweetness can be interpreted in different ways. I oftentimes interpret that sweetness as almost like a, a watermelon rind or a, a, some sort of a melon rind that's maybe sat out in the sun too long and started to to ferment slightly. I get a lot of that flavor. What do you notice about the texture? It's creamy, mm -hmm. but it's harder than creamy. But it's not hard. I don't know. I know I don't have the right word. No, it's of course not. It's a it's a firm cheese. Okay. It's not a cheese that's soft and and pliable, but it crumbles apart. It has sort of a curdy, crumbly texture to it. Yes. But then when you put it in your mouth, it creams up on the palate. It turns into this very creamy texture once you once it starts mixing with the saliva and breaking down. There are not a lot of people who are making it, and there are not a lot of people who are signing up to make it or learning how to make it. It's basically a cheese that is potentially on the verge of extinction. The closing moments of the show, what would you like to leave the audience with? I think the most important thing that I've learned in my transition to this job and, and sticking to it is that you really have to be true to yourself. I didn't start volunteering in the classroom with the intent of getting a job there. I did it because I loved it, because it was the way I wanted to spend my time when I wasn't at work. And then within a few years, it had suddenly turned into a career for me. The other thing is that the first year was really tough. There were a lot of sacrifices that I made. It was a big transition for me. And there were certainly days when I thought, is it worth it? And I'm really glad I stuck it out, I'm really glad that I just persevered through those struggles, because it's been worth it at every single moment. If you have any questions about cheese, or you want to go taste some cheese, go look for Elizabeth down at Murray's. Look forward to hearing from you. Bye now.